Hello and welcome to Talks with Docs, a program of the Lancaster County Medical Society. I'm Dr. Dale Michaels, a family physician, and joining me in the studio today is Dr. Mike Kutaly, who is a cardiologist here in Lincoln, uh, who's been here for several years. And today we're going to talk about one of those topics that a lot of patients don't seem to know an awful lot about, and that's a topic called atrial fibrillation. Now it's not arterial fibrillation, it's just plain atrial fibrillation. So let's talk a little bit about what that means uh, as far as the heart is concerned when it goes into atrial fibrillation because it's usually a process that comes on at some point later on in somebody's life. Sure. Atrial fibrillation uh, is a condition where the heart starts to beat irregular, ir irregularly. The, uh, the top chambers of the heart are called the atria, and the heart, as most people are aware, has four chambers. The top chambers are the atria, and the bottom chambers we call ventricles. Typically, uh, in a normal rhythm, the heart beats in a very organized fashion. The top chambers go first, and then the bottom chambers follow. So the atrium contracts, and then the ventricle, the bottom chamber, contracts. In atrial fibrillation, the top chamber, the atria, they start to contract very rapidly and erratically. The electrical impulses that make the heart beat uh, become very chaotic and disorganized. And it makes the heart rate go very fast and uh, makes patients have palpitations and other symptoms. Yeah, I've sometimes, Mike, tell, tell patients that where the normal heart kind of just goes back and forth, like this, with atrial fibrillation, it's just going like mad and going in all sorts of different directions, and so it doesn't effectively get down to the lower chambers, which are really, as you and I know, of course, the chambers that, that pump the, the blood to where it needs to go. They're the, the big muscle, big part of the muscle that pumps it. That's correct. When people think of their heartbeat, their, the heart is a pump, and they're thinking of the bottom chambers beating. When you feel your pulse, you're actually feeling the bottom chambers, the ventricles. In atrial fibrillation, the top chambers are beating extremely fast, over 300 times a minute. In fact, they're contracting so fast that they are hardly contracting at all. And the ventricles, the bottom chambers, are trying to keep up because that's what the bottom chambers do. They try to keep up. And in that setting, patients start to feel the ventricular rate, the bottom chamber rate, go very fast, and their pulse goes really high. And a lot of times, it's we talk about the old irregular irregularity. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people have an extra beat every three beats or every six beats. But with atrial fibrillation, it's not that kind of a pattern. There really isn't a pattern you can, you can define it. Sometimes it can be slow because and then it'll be real fast and it'll be in between and it just jumps all over. That's right, atrial fibrillation can behave that way. It is very disorganized and chaotic and one of the things that I try to have patients do sometimes is have them describe what their heart is doing to me in clinic because normally the heart should be beating like a drum, steady, 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 steady. If they're in atrial fibrillation, there is no organization at all. It's completely chaotic and disorganized and they really can't, can't demonstrate to me what their heart rate is doing and their heartbeat is doing. Okay. Well, what's the most common symptom that patients will present? Typically, they'll present in my office as a family physician. Then they go from my office to your office next. But typically, what are, what are the most common symptoms? Is it the palpitations or are there some other symptoms that show up? Well, palpitations is number one. Uh, patients often will describe their palpitations in many varying ways. They'll describe a sensation of... Uh, uh, fish flopping in their chest or drums beating or thunder rolling. Uh, you know, people have uh, various ways of describing their symptoms, but palpitations by and large are the number one symptom. Atrial fibrillation can cause other symptoms as well, uh, shortness of breath, particularly shortness of breath with activity, uh, sometimes chest pain, sometimes lightheadedness. Um, those are other symptoms that are associated with atrial fibrillation. And for most patients, is it kind of a sudden onset? I Typically, uh, they're fine, and then all of a sudden, they're not fine? It can happen that way, although people present in different, different ways. Oftentimes, atrial fibrillation happens suddenly, but we'll often see patients who have been in atrial fibrillation, and it kind of happened gradually over time, and they never recognized it. So we see both. Okay. Um, what are some of the causes that uh, we know of to cause atrial fibrillation? I know that for some patients, it's related to having a bad valve, a valve that doesn't work right. But, you know, in my experience as a family physician, I don't see that kind of atrial fibrillation very often, once in a while, but not very often. That's right. Um, 
There are a lot of associated conditions, valvular heart disease being one of them. Uh, it used to be, you know, many years ago, people used to have rheumatic heart disease, rheumatic fever. And in this country, we don't see that as much any, anymore. Um, so valvular heart disease, although still very common and still contributor to atrial fibrillation, is only one of many uh, possible associated conditions. We see it with high blood pressure, um, thyroid disorders, uh, sometimes alcohol uh, use or other uh, uh, toxic type medications, for example, uh, that can contribute to atrial fibrillation. Um, sleep apnea, we know, is associated with atrial fibrillation. Um, coronary artery disease, to some extent, can be associated with atrial fibrillation. So there are many, many uh, associated conditions. How common is it, <coughs> Mike, to see uh, atrial fibrillation in younger people? I can think of a few I've had over the years that were younger, but for the most part, isn't it kind of a middle age older, or tell me about that. Well, we know that the prevalence of atrial fibrillation goes up as we age, so that by the time uh, people reach 80 years of age, uh, almost 10% of that population has atrial fibrillation. But we do also see atrial fibrillation in younger people. I've seen it in people in their teens and 20s and 30s as well. But you're right, by, by and large, the majority of people who have atrial fibrillation tend to be older uh, in their 60s and 70s and 80s. Okay. Well, you're watching uh, Talks with Docs, a program of the Lancaster County Medical Society. And if you have any topics that you would like to see on Talks with Docs, send us an email at talkswithdocs at lcmsne.org. And we'll try and find uh, one of the physicians here in our Lincoln community who can talk about that and uh, give us some information. Uh, it's not designed to uh, be a... a, a show that answers all your personal questions, so we can't do that, but we certainly would like to cover some concerns or diseases that you have an interest that will often affect a, a large share of our Lincoln community. So, Mike, we've talked about a little bit about atrial fibrillation and some of the causes and some of the things that happen. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, treatment. Some of my patients, we they'll have one episode of atrial fibrillation related to something and they never have another one. Others, it comes on and stays and just keeps on going. So tell me a little bit about what your experience has been with, uh, with that. Well, that's a very astute observation. Uh, one of the first things we have to do when we see patients with atrial fibrillation is try and classify them as to exactly where along the spectrum, if you will, of atrial fibrillation they are. Typically, atrial fibrillation starts in a very intermittent fashion where they may have one episode and resolve spontaneously and they may not have another episode for a few months or even a few years. We call that paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, um, the intermittent kind. Uh, as the disease progresses, oftentimes patients become more persistent where their atrial fibrillation lasts for longer periods of time, sometimes over a week and sometimes may need w they, patients may need us to get them out of atrial fibrillation either with uh, medication or with a, a shock, what we call a cardioversion. And then on the far end of the spectrum are patients who are in what we call long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, where they've had atrial fibrillation for over a year, or, or permanent atrial fibrillation where they are, are now chronically in atrial fibrillation and a decision has been made by the patient and the care provider that atrial fibrillation is gonna be a chronic condition that we've accepted. So we, we determine patients uh, uh, where, they, where they live on the spectrum and, and where they kind of reside and what their symptoms are determines how you approach treatment. Okay, well, you mentioned some of the treatment medications or cardioversion. Let's talk a little bit about that. If, if uh, one of my patients shows up in my office and just went into atrial fibrillation and it's the last patient, it always seems to be the last patient of the day on Friday, you know how that is. Yeah. And so we send them, we have to send them off to the emergency room. Let's talk a little bit about some of the treatments that can be used. Uh, we have far more effective medications now than when I first started in practice when we didn't have real good medicines to convert people back into that normal, regular kind of rhythm. Right. So the first thing we want to do when we see patients with atrial fibrillation is try to control the heart rate. I mean, if the heart rate is going very fast and irregular, patients get very symptomatic. So we usually give them medications to slow the rate down. And these medications include very commonly used uh, blood pressure medicines called beta blockers that also slow the heart rate down or calcium channel blockers. Um, 
that's the first step uh, typically that we'll do in the emergency room to try to slow the rate down. Depending on when the atrial fibrillation started, how long they've been in it, uh, will determine how we then approach uh, getting them back into normal rhythm. So that if a patient you just saw in your office and they are certain that they just went into atrial fibrillation that morning, we could try to shock them out of uh, atrial fibrillation with a cardioversion. Uh, this involves putting patches on the front and the back of the chest um, and giving a synchronized shock to reset the heart's rhythm like you would reset a computer. Um, if the patient's been in atrial fibrillation for an unknown duration of time, particularly if they've been in it for more than 24, 48 hours, at that point we wouldn't shock them right away because we'd have to make sure that they haven't developed a clot in the heart, which is the other aspect of atrial fibrillation we haven't talked about yet. We talked about atrial fibrillation causing symptoms of a very rapid and irregular heart rate. Well, the other concern with atrial fibrillation is that it increases the risk of stroke. How does this happen? Well, when the atria, the top chambers, are not contracting in a regular fa uh, fashion, the blood in those chambers is not being squeezed. And when the blood isn't moving, it tends to clot. So if you've been in atrial fibrillation for over, typically we believe, 48 hours, your risk of having a clot in the heart is higher than it would be otherwise. So before we would get you back into normal rhythm with a cardioversion electrically or with a, with a drug, we'd want to make sure that you don't have a clot. The way we do this is by doing what we call a transesophageal echocardiogram. This is a special ultrasound test of the heart where the patient swallows a probe that goes into the stomach, and we use that ultrasound probe to look, to physically look for blood clots in the heart to make sure that we can safely shock the patient back to normal rhythm as long as there's no clot. And sometimes uh, we'll use, if I remember right, we'll use uh, blood thinners, uh, uh, things like heparin, or now there's Lovenox or a number of medicines like that, and put them on it just in case there's a, such a tiny clot that you might not always see it with your uh, echocardiogram to make sure that uh, uh, after we con control their rate and slowed them down, to make sure that if there is a little clot there, we've gotten rid of the clot before you uh, start. Uh, tell me, I think one of the reasons that this happens is when you shock it and it comes from this fibrillation back into regular rhythm, if there's something kind of hanging on the wall, that's what's going to knock it loose, and that's, of course, where we think yeah. about the strokes. No, that's a good point, and a lot of patients ask that question, you know, because you're right, we typically will start patients on blood thinners, particularly if we're going to shock them back into normal rhythm. But patients will ask, well, okay, doctor, I'm in normal rhythm now. Why do I have to stay on the blood thinner? Well, the reason is is because even though we have shocked the heart back to normal rhythm. It takes a while for that mechanical function of the atrium to come back. So for the first three to four weeks after cardioversion, even though on the EKG or normal rhythm, the atrium isn't squeezing like it normally does. It takes about a month for that squeeze to come back. So even though you're in normal rhythm, until that squeeze come back, uh, comes back, we like to protect patients with uh, anticoagulants like warfarin. Um, there are other determinants that help us decide who needs to stay on a blood thinner and who doesn't, other risk factors. Um, we know that your risk of blood clots forming and stroke goes up with atrial fibrillation, particularly if you have a number of risk factors. Uh, these are age over 75, high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, or congestive heart failure. If you have two of those risk factors, we'll typically treat you with blood thinners long term, whether you're in normal rhythm or, atrial, or you're in atrial fibrillation, doesn't matter. You're gonna be on blood thinners because we know that risk of stroke is there. I know a lot of patients get frustrated about you know having to take a blood thinner, and we'll talk a little bit about blood thinners here in a minute, but uh, you know that uh, is a frustration for them to have to be on a medicine and to understand the importance. I, th I was thinking about the atrium as a muscle, which it is, kind of like being if you've had your arm in a cast for a month mm -hmm. and you get your arm out of your cast because the fracture's healed, but the muscles is weak. It takes a few weeks to get that muscle strength back. So I think that's that's an important part. That's a good analogy. Well, <clears throat> if you need a physician referral, we encourage you to contact the Lan Lancaster County Medical Society at 402. 483-4800. Uh, Lincoln is blessed with a great medical community and if you uh, don't have a physician and need a primary care physician, an internist, a family physician, or a pediatrician, 
or if you have a particular medical problem that has already been diagnosed but you feel like you need a specialist in that area, please don't hesitate to contact us at the Lancaster County Medical Society. This is Talks with Docs, and today we're talking with Dr. Mike Cutelli about atrial fibrillation. Well, Mike, we've talked a little bit about the causes and some of the causes, the concerns in terms of the rate and the irregularity, and of course, specifically the risks of, uh, of strokes in uh, these patients and why it's so important. Because some people think, well, you know, it happened once, it's not a big deal. So it's important to talk about that. Let's talk a little bit, you mentioned uh, blood thinners, warfarin, or in the old days, we didn't have a generic, it was always called Coumadin, and some of us even still call it a generic Coumadin, but warfarin, which is unfortunately really a rat poison, but in a very predicted amount. We're very careful about how we give it. That's right. uh, it keeps uh, the blood from clotting, uh, but it has to be monitored with, uh, with blood tests. There's some other things out there. Tell me a little bit about some of the newer things that are coming to try and prevent uh, these blood clots from occurring. Right, well, we're living in a very exciting time for anticoagulation now because you're right, uh, previously warfarin was pretty much it uh, for blood thinning agents. I mean, you had to be on warfarin and warfarin, as you alluded to, can be very difficult to manage. Uh, warfarin works against vitamin K and we get vitamin K in our diet so it's affected by things you eat. Your, your blood thinning level can really be a challenge to regulate. Well fortunately now we have a couple of new anticoagulants that came on the market in the last two to three years. These are uh, uh, blood thinning agents that work through a different mechanism than warfarin does and that don't involve uh, routine blood checks uh, where we have to check to make sure the blood is adequately thinned. You take the drug, depending on the, on the agent, once or twice a day, and we have to adjust it for kidney function. But for the most part, they're very well tolerated. And uh, some of the studies have shown that the uh, benefits of these drugs actually supersede warfarin. So it's, it's very exciting. Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, one of my experiences has been that uh, they're, still, they're, in, they're more expensive. So you want to make sure that you have some good insurance coverage if you're going to use them. Uh, and there are certain reasons to talk with your cardiologist or with your family physician about these medicines because there are some specific reasons you shouldn't right. uh, shouldn't take them uh, for for various reasons. Right. If you've had bleeding or if you've had a, a stroke maybe or something like that, they want us to be a little cautious uh, uh, about taking uh, some of those medicines. Right. Uh, yeah, these agents, uh, you know, they've been specifically... Uh, designed for patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Uh, there are no other uh, groups of patients right now that we are treating uh, with these agents. And you're right, uh, bleeding is a big problem. Uh, of course, when we put people on blood thinners, we're doing it to prevent clots from forming, but the other side of that coin is the risk of bleeding. Some of these newer agents, uh, we don't have a good way to reverse, so that if you had a bleeding issue, there's no good antidote. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to weigh all these things clinically with the patient and talk about risks and benefits, the risk of having a stroke versus the risk of bleeding on one of the agents, and it can be a challenge. You know, it's interesting, Mike. I was thinking as, as you and I were talking, we both use the term blood thinner. I had a patient recently who came in and said, well, doc, my blood doesn't look any thinner than it always has. Right. And so even though we use this term, what we really mean is it just doesn't clot as quickly. Okay. It looks the same. Uh, you still bleed red. You know, it doesn't change. It doesn't get more watery or anything like that. It just doesn't clot. So I think it's an important thing for people not to be overly concerned about you and I always use the term blood thinners, but it really doesn't thin it. It just makes it so it doesn't clot as well. Right. It takes much longer for the blood to clot when you're on these agents. So, Okay. Well, if you have any topics that you would like to have talked about on Talks with Docs, send us an email at talkswithdocs at lcmsne.org, and we'll try and find specialists and individuals uh, who can work uh, with us on this. Uh, to present this topic of medical interest to you. Today, we're talking with Dr. Mike Kutaley about a phenomenon called atrial fibrillation, which really sounds like a bigger term than it is. You and I are kind of used to it. It is fairly significant and certainly caused some problems. As we think about, Mike, we've talked about medicines, we've talked about some of the causes, what we try to do to treat it, what the side effects certainly can be in terms of physical side effects or strokes. 
Uh, you all have been doing some things now uh, along with some of the cardi other cardiologists to try and take away this risk with surgical kind of procedures or almost like surgical. You don't actually open up and go in the heart, but you go through uh, the, uh, the, the veins or arteries in the groin or in the arm and you go in and you can do some things. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of those procedures that are, I know for cardiologists, they're always the things that gets them real excited. Yeah. Uh, patients maybe don't get so excited about, but many of my patients have had really great results. So let's talk about that. Right, well, we know that the triggers for atrial fibrillation the, the cells that are firing that make uh, the atrium go into fibrillation uh, tend to come from the pulmonary veins. These are the veins that uh, drain the lungs into the left atrium, the top chamber on the left side. 90% of those triggers come from one of those four pulmonary veins. So in the late 90s, we started doing catheter ablation of the pulmonary veins in an attempt to cure atrial fibrillation. Uh, essentially what we're doing is we're, we're trying to prevent those triggers from escaping the veins and going into the atrium and making the atrium go into fibrillation. So catheter ablation is one thing we can do uh, by doing what we call a pulmonary vein isolation procedure, ablating around those pulmonary veins to try to cure atrial fibrillation. And in a select group of patients, uh, particularly patients with a paroxysmal type of atrial fibrillation, not so much the long-standing persistent type, but the, the more intermittent comes and goes kind of atrial fibrillation, we can achieve success cure with atrial fibrillation with a catheter 70 to 80 percent of the time. So tell me what you mean by the word ablation. I yes. suspect there are a lot of people who say to ablate something means to wipe it out and it really isn't quite that bad but t talk a little bit about it and I think you brought along yeah. maybe a little catheter to show people the kinds of things that that we can do with these sorts of things to to see what uh, happens when we uh, ablate or change things. So. Indeed I have. So this is a catheter. Um, and you're right, in this instance when we talk about catheter ablation, what we're talking about is uh, providing electrical uh, cautery, electric cautery in the heart to try to get rid of abnormal tissue. So uh, we use radiofrequency energy uh, to ablate abnormal tissue inside the heart and prevent atrial fibrillation from happening. You can see catheter is just a plastic tube and on the end of it there are some electrodes that allow us to look at conduction inside the heart and get an intracardiac EKG but also to do ablation where we perform cautery inside the heart. So um, this is one way of, of curing atrial fibrillation. The catheter goes through the groin. The patient, of course, is under anesthesia. Uh, the, the catheter goes up into the heart. And to do a pulmonary vein isolation procedure, you have to go from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart, across that wall, that septum that separates the two chambers, and isolate inside the pulmonary veins or, or around the pulmonary veins. Uh, another method that we can do ablation is with freezing. So you have radiofrequency energy as one way of doing an ablation, and freezing where we use a balloon to make the uh, areas very, very cold, that's another way we can do ablation inside the, uh, inside the heart. So it's kind of like when I take off a little skin lesion and I kind of burn the base to make it stop bleeding, well, you're able to do this uh, technically through uh, the, the catheter up into the heart or freezing like freezing the wart, you're just doing it inside the heart. So it takes a lot of skill and I think it takes a little more time to do some of these, doesn't it usually? Yeah, the catheter ablation procedures, particularly those for atrial fibrillation, can take a couple hours to do and it can be involved. It involves uh, being very meticulous and uh, mapping, detailed mapping of the inside of the heart and finding those pulmonary veins and ablating on the outside of them, either with cautery or with freezing. So. So it's a, it's a little, and as you say, you want to get it all. You want to go all the way around because if you left one little opening, it's kind of like leaving a little hole in the fence. The dog is going to probably find its way through. So you really want to That's get... That's exactly what it's like. You, you cannot allow any gaps to occur in your line because if you allow a little gap in that fence, as you call it, that trigger can escape the pulmonary vein and go into the atrium and cause fibrillation. So we have to take a lot of care to make sure that when we do our ablation, we've created a nice roadblock and uh, preventing the, the triggers from, from escaping the veins. And uh, occasionally, does it have to be done more than once? I've had a couple patients where I think they've had to kind of go back later and maybe touch up a little bit or That's something. That's right. That's right. So, you know, on average, we say about 70 to 80 percent success rate. What that means is, you know, 20 to 30 percent of the time, patients may need a second procedure to touch up, to cover up the gaps that might have occurred.
uh, after the first procedure. When I talk to patients about catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation, I try to prep them mentally to the fact that they may need more than one procedure and that sometimes success uh, may be difficult to achieve with a catheter. Okay. One of the things we haven't mentioned that we ought to maybe think about, a pacemaker doesn't really help atrial fibrillation, although occasionally you have to put a pacemaker in, at least in my experience, maybe after the ablation more often, but a pacemaker doesn't necessarily help atrial fibrillation, at least in my experience. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right, so uh, when we talk about the treatment of atrial fibrillation, uh, one of the things we try to do is control the rhythm, and controlling the rhythm oftentimes uh, involves things like cardioversion, medications, or catheter ablation, which we've discussed, meaning we're trying to actively put the patient back in normal rhythm uh, with one of those methodologies. The other uh, way we treat atrial fibrillation is controlling the heart rate, which again, things like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers to slow the rate of the heart down. A pacemaker has one main function, and that is to treat slow heart rates. Oftentimes when we use beta blockers or calcium channel blockers or the medicine digoxin to slow the rate down, well, the rate can get too slow. So in, in those circumstances, when we're using medicines to slow the rate down, we don't want the heart rate to be 40, the patient will be very uncomfortable. So putting a pacemaker in kind of helps control the lower end of things, and the medication then allows us to treat the rapid, irregular heart rate. So it gives you a little more safety with the medicines if there's a pacemaker in and the medicines work a little too well, as it were, to slow things down, then you'll use a, a pacemaker. And some of my patients with the atrial, uh, with the ablation have had to end up with a pacemaker because it seems like we've taken care of the fibrillation, but now they're a little slow and That's symptomatic right. from that. Yeah, it, it is a safety net, as you say, to treat the slow rates and to give patients some comfort so the rate isn't too slow. Sometimes in patients, if we have decided that the atrial fibrillation is permanent and we're having a hard time controlling the rate, we have to ablate or cauterize the, the connection between the top and the bottom chambers in an area we call the AV node. In those patients, we are basically uh, getting rid of the connection between the chambers and they become dependent on the pacemaker. So oftentimes when we do an AV node ablation, we'll have to put a pacemaker in place. And, and that's the one other way to control the heart rate. Okay. So atrial fibrillation can be a challenge for patients, but it's obviously very treatable, it works well. We've got lots of techniques that we didn't used to have, medicines that work better than what we used to have, and so people shouldn't be frightened about it. They just need to really consider that, okay, if I've got it, let's deal with it, get it fixed, and people will live a long time. Even if they have to stay in atrial fibrillation, they may just have to take some medicines, but they'll live a long time. That's right. I mean, that's one of the things I try to impart to patients about atrial fibrillation is, number one, you know, they're in very good company. A lot of patients have atrial fibrillation, uh, and the prevalence is just going up as the population ages. Um, you know, you have rock stars and politicians, uh, sinners and saints all get atrial fibrillation. Uh, so uh, we know that people get it, uh, but you're right, it is very treatable, and we have a lot of options to treat it, either with uh, medication or procedures like catheter ablation or even surgical ablation. So it's, it's treatable and uh, it's manageable and okay. oftentimes Good. curable. Well, you know, it's been fun to talk with you, Mike, uh, talking with Dr. Mike Cutaley, who's a cardiologist here in Lincoln. This is Dr. Dale Michaels. I'm one of the co-hosts of Talks with Docs of the Lancaster County Medical Society, and we thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm.